Good morning. This morning I want to talk about um, something that relates to the series on Romans. Um, but we're going to call it Grace, Faith, and Works. And so a month ago I, I gave a lesson on Amazing Grace, the, the well-known hymn, Amazing Grace. And so it was a, a story about how the hymn was developed and written, the story of the, the writer. But then also a focus on the concept of grace. And simply put, grace is unmerited favor. It's a blessing that we don't deserve. And that's kind of what we talked about. And so before we continue on in our study on Romans, and I guess in a way this, this lesson is a little bit a, a part of our next study on Romans, but I wanted to lay some groundwork on this subject, or these three subjects of grace, faith, and works. And there's a lot of confusion in the religious world uh, about these things and, and how they relate. There's a, a very popular idea of, of faith only or faith alone. Uh, once saved, always saved. These ideas uh, promoted by Martin Luther and John Calvin and Calvinism. But uh, you know, we want to endeavor to understand what does the Bible say on these topics and, and getting a cultural understanding of you know, what does the language say and what does, what does the cultural context of the day and the Back in the day when these things were written, how were these words understood? Uh, so get that proper context rather than the issues that were of paramount concern during the Protestant Reformation hundreds of years ago. We want to go a couple thousand years ago to get the, the, the ultimate original context of these things. So we're going to expand uh, on these, these three concepts and see the interplay between them of, of grace and faith and works together. So we want to kind of define our terms because that's part of the problem of the confusion among different folks on these matters. So we want to look briefly again at grace. So we talked about that before a month ago as I said and it's that idea of unmerited favor. It's this idea that God saved us by his grace. It's not something we deserve. We didn't, we didn't earn our salvation and look what we did. Now I earned this salvation. You know, the wages of sin is death, and it's this free gift that we have uh, to be able to have salvation. Uh, Titus 3, 7, that having been justified by his grace, that's how we're justified, by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're justified not because of how great we are or some super thing we did, but by the grace of God, this unmerited thing. We don't deserve it. God loves us. And he offers these blessings for us he gave his son to die on the cross as an atonement for us. So there's this idea that God's grace is active. It's, it's something God does or has done, continues to offer for us. You know, we look at uh, John 1.17, where the law was given through Moses, so the law of Moses, right? But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And we think about well, what does that entail? Well, there's something that was done there, right? God sent his son, Jesus, to come to the earth and it was, it was operative in what Jesus did and he died for us. And so that's God's part. Grace is God's part. We can't do that. God blesses us with this grace. But the second word in our study, this idea of faith, is, is our part. That's our response to God's grace. And so this comes from a, a Greek word family, really, this pistis is the, the Greek word, but there's nouns and verbs and adjectives that describe things using this various roots, various versions of this root of pistis. And broadly speaking, we can think that there's sort of three senses that we can see this being used in the Bible, because words have a kind of a, a spectrum of meaning. So one meaning of faith, or one sense in which faith is used, or this this pistis word, word group, it's the idea of belief. And that's probably the, the common idea, the, the, the first thing people think of in our culture. Well, do you, do you believe that that is true or not, right? And the Bible does use it that way. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6 is an example we could look at. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. So what is this faith? For, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. You have to believe that God exists. 
and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So you have to believe God exists, and you have to believe that he's going to be the one who's going to reward us with things if we, if we seek him, right? So we need, to, we need to agree with that true idea that God exists, and we need to understand that he is the one who will reward us with the eternal life, but there's that response. We need to seek him. We need to seek him. But this sense of belief this is, is really the sometimes the simplistic, that's all it means kind of idea that uh, we might have in our, in our culture today. But faith can also be used in the sense of our conscience. So our faith is sort of, our conscience is uh, calibrated by our, our faith, and then we can talk about it in that sense. So our personal conviction, our conscience. A verse like Romans 14, uh, verse 23, has a, a use of that. Uh, it says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. So this, this idea, it's not really according to our conscience. It's, of course, calibrated by the Word of God. And so that sense can be used as our conscience. And then, a lot of times, it can be used as the faith. And sometimes it's actually used with the, that, the, the word the in front of it. The faith is sort of the, the idea of the practice of religion approved by God. We might just say Christianity itself, the faith, the faith that we all share. You know, Ephesians 4 5 talks about one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We, we have this one faith, this one common standard of what the faith is, or what our behaviors ought to be as Christians, the standard for Christians to follow. We follow the one Lord. This is part of the one faith, and we, we all submit to that one practice of baptism. So this, in this sense of the faith, it's the, the practices to follow and obey, the things to understand and believe and teach, and to be faithful to. We might say faithfulness, trust, loyalty, and allegiance. And another angle we could look at this idea of, of faith or, or pistis in ancient culture, there's an interesting book that I've read recently called Gospel Allegiance. It's by a, a, a Bible scholar named Matthew Bates. And he goes into some of the ancient non-biblical writings from the time to get a sense of what is faith? What, what was faith understood to be even at the time? And so he argues, as his title would suggest, that uh, allegiance, allegiance might be a, a better translation a lot of times to refer to this, this pistis, this faith, this belief, the way we try to put it in English. And it emphasizes the active nature of this faith, of this pistis, this allegiance. And... Uh, you know, our modern culture misunderstands what that, what that really is about. Often we think of it as an internal feeling or, or a mental agreement to a proposition. There might be, uh, hey, is this true? Yes, I agree that that is true. Well, you believe that. That, that, that is often how we, we think of it in our culture. But in this, in this book, uh, he, he mentions in the New Testament era, a person would enact their faith or their pistis towards someone or something someone else by outward doing it has this connection to our doing it's not just a, a thing we agree with but our agreement with that actually is demonstrated by doing something about that and he gives some examples from that culture and time as well for instance a lawyer practices pistis or loyalty toward a powerless client, even when it is socially risky. So they, it's not just that they uh, think that's a good idea, but they're actually helping that person in difficult circumstances. And that's faithfulness or loyalty, this, this word that we're talking about for faith. Or uh, a subject, uh, a person under a king, a subject, uh, this, these people who are subject to a king, they show their loyalty or their pistis to their overlords by supporting rather than undermining the regime. They're actually saying good things or, or doing the things that are necessary to, to have that, uh, that ruler be supported. And maybe the best example to think about is a soldier. Soldiers stand by their king in battle, showing him pistis or allegiance. So he's not just uh, 
thinking the, the king's good, you know. He, he's standing there in battle. The soldiers that are faithful are there to fight, and to fight to the end, to defend the kingdom and to defend their king, and this, this sense of loyalty. It's not necessarily this idea of agreeing with a fact, but getting in there and doing it. And knowing this, this context of the, the way that this word was used, even in the broader culture, even outside of the Bible, can help us shape our understanding of, of what the gospel writers meant and the New Testament writers, it's just Paul, what they meant when they used this word to describe this idea that we're talking about of faith. And the third word is, is works. I'm talking about grace and faith and works. So there's at least three different types of works that we can think about in different contexts in the Bible. We might think about the works of the law of Moses. Oftentimes that's what's being discussed. So the Jewish people had been under the law of Moses, and so sometimes that's the works in a certain context. Or sometimes... It's the idea of works of personal merit. There's the great things we can do, and we want to brag about them. Look what I did, that sort of thing. Those are our works that we did. That's a different idea, but that's a different idea than, than also the works of obedience. A different idea here. We need to obey God and do what he says. We, these are demonstrations of our faith, actually, these works of obedience. It's this is faith in action. And so we need to be thinking about these three different types of works when we encounter a passage that uses the word works. Like, which, which are we talking about? You need to keep that in mind. Which are we talking about? So the law of Moses, you know, Jewish people were under the law of Moses, and they tended to consider it a badge of honor that they were God's people, and they had the law of Moses, and they were doing that. And they kind of looked down on the Gentiles, the heathen people, because they didn't have the law. And so that's, that's one set of controversies, and the discussions of the law of Moses and the, the way people looked at things there. But then this works of personal merit is the great things we can do and brag about those things. You know, think of all the ways that, that you helped people and the good things you do and get puffed up about that. And, well, look at all that good stuff I did. With enough good works, maybe we can finally convince God that, that we're great and that he should save us. That is not how it works. God does not uh, need those things. Uh, Isaiah 64, verse 6, he, the, the, the prophet there says, but, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Even the good things we do aren't really all that great in God's sight. But he wants us to obey him. He wants us to obey him, but we're not earning something. And then this idea of works of obedience, you know, if God tells us something to do, should we do it? If God tells us not to do something, well, should we just do it anyway? Does it even matter? You know, some would have us suggest that it doesn't matter because we're saved by grace and it doesn't matter what we do. But what is expected of faithful Christians. Faithfulness. A faithful servant obeys and serves his master. The faithful soldier follows and, and does the work of a soldier, and defends and fights. You know, we need to obey and we need to do what God says. This is faithful obedience. And it's not a work of personal merit to obey what God has told us to do. So we might think about Romans chapter 4. This is kind of what got me to thinking about this lesson to begin with, some of the things we'll encounter in Romans 4. So what's Paul talking about here in Romans 4? He says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has, according, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. You, you deserve those things if you work and you have wages coming. And so in this context, Paul is quoting back to Genesis 15 about Abraham. 
Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham believed God. There's that word, that pistis, that idea there. So what are we talking about? He was not justified by works. Well, there's that word works again. What are we, what are we talking about? Well, to make it a little more interesting, James chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, we have this same passage quoted from Genesis 15 that James is looking at from a little different perspective. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and here's Genesis 15 again, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that man is justified by works and not by faith only. Oh, wait a minute. What? what? Didn't Paul just say back in Romans 4 that Abraham was, was not justified by works, but by faith? And didn't Paul just quote the same passage to make his point? Are these two inspired writers contradicting one another? Or is perhaps one of them not inspired? You know, Martin Luther is famous for uh, uh, not having a good view of James, and he, he said this letter of James was a, an epistle of straw, which is to kind of say it's worthless. It's just a, something to be burned up. It was no good, because it didn't fit with what he understood Paul to be saying. But I would suggest to you that these guys aren't in conflict at all. And the questions to ask is, are they talking about different types of works in these, in these cases? I think they are. So let's break it down back to Romans 4, verse 3. It says, for, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. There's this, this pistis, this faith idea, and that that's good for being considered righteous. So what does that belief entail? Is it simply that Abraham agreed to the proposition that God was, was real and not false? Or was it faithful obedience under consideration here? You know, verse 5, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So it's not it's not work, but what are we talking about by work? He's believing on him, and his faith is accounted for righteousness. So, so, what, so what's this faith of, and what works and obedience? What are we talking about here? What type of works is Paul talking about? And think back to our list of, of what those could be. Are we talking about works of the law of Moses? Or works of personal merit? Or are we talking about works of obedience? And, you know, we've been studying through Romans for a while. You know, so what, what type of works is Paul talking about in Romans 4, or really the, the book? You know, the whole situation in Romans, the whole occasion of the book is this conflict between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, and whether the law of Moses is, has any bearing on being a Christian. And the answer is, it, it doesn't. That's, but that's the conflict. The Jewish Christians were like, well, we need to have the law of Moses and these Gentiles need to do it too and, and there's sort of this conflict over the importance of that. And going back a little bit, you know, Romans chapter 2 and chapter 3 are really all about how the law of Moses is contrasted with the law of faith. So do we need to follow the, the items there in the law of Moses or do we need to follow Christ? There are two laws, the law of Moses, the law of Christ. I guess we didn't let's talk about that one. But anyway, the Jews were trusting in the law of Moses, and the Gentiles weren't, and that was the conflict. The Jewish Christians were, were trusting in that, and, and that's the conflict. But the law of Moses was not going to save them. Rather, faith in Christ Jesus was going to save them. That's the law of Christ. Now, Abraham, if you think about your timeline, Abraham wasn't exactly under the law of Moses, because he was before Moses. But since Abraham, in the course of his faith journey, had been circumcised, and of course cir circumcision was a major emphasis in the law of Moses, it's sort of like, well, what we claim him, I mean, he's, 
he's of course the father of, of them and sort of latching on to that fact that well he was circumcised and we're circumcised as part of the law of Moses and so you know that's all important and so he's you know the question is he saved by his works works of the law the circumcision and that's the point is made then you know when did he even be when was he even circumcised was it was it before or after he was circumcised that he was considered righteous and that's the question asked in verses 9 and 10 does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also so the Jews or also the Gentiles is the question for the Romans for we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. We said that before, right? Abraham was faithful in some sense, and that was considered, he was considered righteous. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? No, if you go back and look at the sequence of those things, it, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Before he was circumcised, these things were said where his, he had faith and it was counted to him. As righteousness so the argument in, in Romans is again the, the Jews versus the Gentiles following the law particularly circumcision which is sort of shorthand for the law the works of the law so we do that or not you know Abraham was righteous before he was even circumcised so it was apart from the law apart from the works of the law of Moses so therefore it's not the works of the law of Moses circumcision that justify us but instead it's this faithful obedience just like Abraham did and if we look at how James discusses that and describes that James 2 21 was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works Faith was made perfect. Faith and works are working together to make faith complete. So in Romans 4, we have this discussion, this question about the works of the law of Moses, circumcision. That did not save Abraham because he had this righteousness said about him prior to being circumcised to begin with. So we're not saved by the works of the law of Moses circumcision but James 2 we see that we're saved by works of obedience talking about offering his son Isaac That's something he actually did in response to his to his faith he goes on to say in verse 26 for as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also faith and works of obedience go together Faith and works of obedience are faithfulness. It's faith. This is the actual faith that the, we're being discussed the whole time. This pistis, this original idea. The faithful soldier who actually stands and fights and, and, and actually does what he's supposed to do. That's a faithful soldier. Faithful Christians actually do what we're supposed to do. Faith without works is dead. And so we see grace and faith and works all three of these things are involved in our salvation you know we need to obey the gospel and that words that phrase is even used uh, in uh, I think I've lost my place here anyway second Thessalonians 1 8 says in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to obey the gospel. There's this danger of having flaming fire of vengeance. If we just look at God's will and say, oh, you want us to do all this? Whatever, I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, we get flaming fire of vengeance if that's our attitude. If that's our attitude, we do not know God. Are we obeying the gospel or not? We need to obey the gospel. So we have grace and faith and works. And James 2.26 tells us, For as the body without the spirit is dead, 
So faith without works is dead also. Let's keep that in mind. Is our faith dead? Is our faith characterized by our works? Or is our faith merely a thought that we agree with something? Faith without works, faith that only agrees with a thought but doesn't do anything about it, that kind of faith is dead. So how does your faith measure up to biblical faith? If we examine ourselves, have we fallen prey to the idea that we simply need to agree with an idea? Maybe the idea that God is real. There's a lot of people in the world today that would say that's just all a fairy tale. Well, but I believe God is real. Is taking that stand to simply believe that God is real in contrast to those who do not agree with that idea? Is that, is that faith? Is that in and of itself the totality of what faith is? If you simply believe that Jesus is the Christ, you agree with that? Or you agree that Jesus loves you? Is that what we're talking about for faith? Those things are true, and we should believe those things and agree that those propositions are true. But since they're true, since God is real, since Jesus is the Messiah and the King, our King, we need to actually respond in faithful obedience. So do you love Jesus? That's one of the things to think about. Do you love Jesus? John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, loves me, Jesus, me, right? Jesus is saying this. If anyone loves Jesus, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. So we need to keep his word if we love Jesus, if we love God. We need to have faith in Jesus and to demonstrate that in faithful obedience. And we have this promise to be with the Lord. It tells us quite simply in Mark 16, 16, he who believes, and what we should be thinking what that means to believe, and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. He who does not have this faithful allegiance, this loyalty, this believing obedience, all of those things t together, if you don't do that, well, then we're just thumbing our nose at God. Why would we expect him to give us his grace and favor that he's offering us as a free gift if we just don't care? We aren't going to do it where he wants. So, is there anyone that needs to respond to the call for faith? Call for faithful obedience. Can we help you? you? Do you need to be baptized? Do you need prayers? Perhaps um, having a watered-down version of faith as is so common in our culture. Do you need to make some changes in your life? Do you need to study some more? You know, we want to we want to help us all to grow together, to be to be able to be forever with the Lord. We're going to sing a song here. I actually asked Caleb to lead this song. Trust and obey. So trust is one of those words for faith, right? We should trust in the Lord. We need to believe in Him. We also need to obey. It all goes together. We have that faith. We have that faithfulness. We have that faithful obedience. Will you trust and obey? We invite you to come as we stand and sing the song together. <laughs>